Sergeants, uh, you may begin your recordings. And, and Mr. Bradley, I will pass it over to you. Okay. Hello, good morning. And welcome to today's New York City Council hearing of the Committee of Economic Development. At this time, will all panelists please turn on your videos. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. We may begin. Well, let me officially kick us off and gavel in the meeting. So welcome everyone to today on June 24th, 2020 to our Committee on Economic Development. Uh, my name is Councilmember Paul Ballone and I have the privilege of chairing this committee today. These are unprecedented times for New York and indeed entire our world. In Governor Cuomo's final coronavirus press briefing last Friday, he noted that in 111 days, we went from a doomsday scenario with the potential of over 136,000 potential beds needed in our city to reality of just 19,000 beds required statewide during our peak at this crisis. While there remains a long battle ahead for this city to ensure we keep the virus at bay and hopefully return to normal or a new normal, arguably the entity, entity most responsible for ensuring the city was able to withstand the storm was the Economic Development Corporation. I'd like to take this opportunity to applaud the efforts of EDC in scrambling its resources to prepare the city for an anticipated surge of infections and hospitalizations that thankfully did not materialize in the numbers we all feared. While EDC often flies under the radar in the news and our public discourse, it is important to acknowledge its work, especially in this time of crisis. Whether it was dredging the Hudson River in record time to accommodate the depth necessary for the 1,000 bed hospital ship USNS Comfort, partnering with over 140 local businesses to develop and manufacture critical personal protective equipment right here in our city, or working with logistics companies, food distribution centers, and city agencies to set up truck rest stops in order to keep the city's food supply chains intact. EDC has been there to keep the city going. The purpose of today's hearing is to give the Economic Development Corporation an opportunity to discuss its various relief efforts during this COVID-19 crisis and to highlight its successes as well as glean valuable lessons learned in the event of a second or third wave of infections once the current state of emergency is declared over. In fact, really just to kind of give us a blueprint of what was done, what can be done, and what will be done in the future. EDC remains heavily involved in ensuring all New Yorkers have access to COVID-19 testing by procedure, by preparing, sorry, 100,000 test kits each week, by acting as a focal point for the city's business community to provide information on available loan, grant, and other business assistance programs. We on this committee encourage EDC to continue these efforts to sustain the city's economy as the first stage of this crisis now begins to die down in New York and as we enter phase two and look forward to phase three. With that, with that said, I know we have a lot to cover. Um, we were gonna give some time to public advocate Jumani Williams who can no longer make it. So we're going to submit his testimony. So anyone would like to see our public advocate's testimony, we'll have that linked up. Um, but I also like to thank the extraordinary work done by everyone on the committee and my staff, especially the legislative council Alex Polinoff, the new daddy who just celebrated Father's Day again, policy analyst Emily Forgione, and finance analyst, analyst Ali for all their hard work for putting this hearing together. Um, the, all the word, hard work behind the scenes really does make us look amazing. And they have been working nonstop between this hearing, the budget, the crisis. So I personally can't thank um, the staff and we're basically family enough. So what I'd like to do and now turn it over to our moderator, Committee Council and New Dad, Alex Polinoff to go over some procedural items. Thank you, Chair Vallone. I'm Alex Polinoff, Counsel to the Economic Development Committee of the New York City Council. Before we begin testimony, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called upon to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. 
The first panelist to give testimony today will be the president and CEO of the New York City Economic Development Corporation, James Patchett. In addition, Lydia Downing, Senior Vice President for Government and Community Relations at EDC, will be available to answer questions. I will call on you when it is your turn to speak. During the hearing, if a council member would like to ask a question of EDC or of a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes the panelists to answer your questions. Please note that for ease of this virtual hearing, there will not be a second round of questioning outside of questions from the committee chair. All hearing participants should submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Before we begin testimony, I will administer the oath. President Patchett, Vice President Downing, please raise your right hand. I will call on each of you individually for a response. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? President Patchett. I do. Vice President Downing. I do. Thank you. President Patchett, you may begin your testimony. Well, let me just jump in, James, before you start and recognize council members Ku and Menchaka have joined us and as additional committee uh, council members come in, we will just acknowledge that they're here. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Chair Vallone. Uh, good to see you and members of the Economic Development Committee. My name is James Patchett and I'm president and CEO of the New York City Economic Development Corporation, also known as EDC. Over the past three months, New York has changed. COVID-19 brought us and the world to a standstill. Terms and practices that were once uncommon, social distancing, face masks in public settings, and virtual gatherings like this one are now part of our new, somewhat bizarre normal. This does feel strange being on a Zoom call with all of you uh, for a hearing, but these are the unusual times we live in and the types of precautions that we have to take. That being said, it is good to see all your faces uh, for the first time in a while. I hope everyone and their families are doing well. But working from home has certainly been an adjustment for me. Uh, my staff will tell you that my kids and my cat have been featured guests in many of our meetings. I don't think they're gonna be joining us today, but you never know. Today, we're having an important discussion about EDC's role in the city's response to COVID-19. I'm pleased to share my testimony and not only highlight our efforts as an organization, but the resilience of the city and its people and our own businesses and the path forward to a new normal that benefits all New Yorkers. The past three months have been among the most challenging in New York City's history. Thousands of our neighbors and loved ones have died from this terrible disease. Our city shut down and is just getting underway with the process of reopening. Many New Yorkers just like us continue to work from home and adapt to new professional challenges while juggling childcare and family obligations. Alex, it sounds like you've got to adapt. But if this crisis has reminded me of anything is that you should never count out New York City. We step up for one another and we fight for our city. It's just what we do. I've seen this fight firsthand at EDC. We have been responsible uh, we have been supporting the city's response to COVID-19 from the very beginning. In early March, we were a traditional economic development organization focused on making strategic investments to create jobs. Then in a matter of days, we transformed ourselves into a biotech startup, manufacturing corporation, a place that set up hospitals and built ventilators. Our cruise terminals morphed into hospitals and our armories into food distribution centers. We stood up local supply chains from scratch and produced critical medical supplies. We've worked with members of the New York delegation to advocate for more federal resources for our businesses. And while these have certainly been long days, I'm incredibly inspired by the innovation, creativity, and tenacity that my team and people across the city have shown in these extraordinary times. It all began with an ask to produce face shields. In a matter of days, we had a design, a prototype, and an approval from the Department of Health. And a day later, we were in production. Over the past couple of months, we've partnered with 15 domestic manufacturers, nine of which are in New York City, to create over 4 million shields. It was mid-March when we were asked to do the seemingly impossible, build a new ventilator. In that moment, if you'd asked me to explain the term HEPA filter, PEEP valve, or manual resuscitator bag, I would have been at a loss for words. How quickly things change. 
When the mayor first asked, it seemed crazy that we could ever do this. A ventilator is an incredibly complicated instrument, and the thought that we could figure it out, build it, and scale production in just a few weeks, and all within New York City, seemed impossible. But we're New Yorkers, so we got to work. We set up a 15-person team from scratch, people who have never done anything like this before. They quickly became experts in FDA certification, the supply chains for medical grade materials, and translating medical research into manufacturing specs. In less than a month, we identified and convened a consortium of researchers from MIT with local innovators and manufacturers to design, develop, and deliver this life-saving technology. These breathing assistant machines free up ICU ventilators for critically ill patients, which was an absolute top priority at the height of this medical crisis and unfortunately may be again. The rapid evolution in technology, the investments the city made in the tech sector, and the relationships ED develop, EDC developed through diversifying the economy and planning for the future all came together in a pivotal moment. This was only possible because New York City had done two very important things in the preceding decades. First, we invested heavily to cultivate our tech sector and became a capital of innovation for the new economy. And second, we remembered our city's roots and continued to ensure that there were still people in New York City who could make things. Our key partners in this effort included New Lab, an innovative tech space in Brooklyn that enables tech innovation. The ventilators were produced at Boyce Technologies in Long Island City, a state-of-the-art manufacturer. EDC has supported both New Lab and Boyce over the last several years, and the capacity they brought to the table is the only reason we were able to design and produce 3,000 new ventilators here in New York to respond to this crisis. And beyond technology, EDC has made strategic investments in key industries like fashion and garment manufacturing. And those investments are paying incredible dividends today. As Broadway went dark, this community did not think about themselves, but how they could support our frontline workers. It didn't take long for EDC to connect with Javier Munoz, a Broadway star best known for playing the lead role in Hamilton. Javier is leading the Broadway Relief Project, which united Broadway seamstresses, actors, and other members of the community. The goal, produce and distribute thousands of hospital gowns for our healthcare heroes, all while bringing members of the Broadway community back together. This partnership is a true testament to New Yorkers supporting New Yorkers. And with the support and guidance of EDC, the project produced over 50,000 gowns. And this is only one example of our work in this space. HD Fashion, minority-owned business produced and, produced and shipped 420,000 gowns in only five weeks. This effort was made possible through their work with nine subcontractors, all of which are minority and women-owned businesses. It's important to note that through this work, HD Fashion was able to retain nearly 130 workers. We've now partnered with 14 local manufacturers across five boroughs. To date, we've produced 3.2 million gowns. There were many days in the depths of this crisis that hospitals would have run out of gowns if it wasn't for this effort. Now I share these stories not just because of, because of what they say about our work to date, but also because I believe it points to the way, it points the way to our collective economic recovery. Thankfully, we've seen incredible progress on the health side. Due to the tenacity of New Yorkers and hard work of our medical professionals, we are on the other side of the health crisis. And while health and safety must always be the top priority, it is time to look toward the future and the recovery that lies ahead. New York City hit a major milestone on Monday when it entered phase two. As the reopening of the economy moves forward, we must always follow the data and science. That is why our efforts to rapidly scale up testing are key. Here again, New York City's innovators are stepping up to be part of the solution. At EC, we built a new supply chain with local biotech companies and small manufacturers and are now in production on 50,000 COVID-19 testing kits per week. In a matter of weeks, our team consulted with experts across the country, forged relationships with local manufacturers, worked with medical professionals and city agencies to review swab designs, figured out sanitation and vetting processes for medical use, and then quickly found local manufacturers to begin production. Again, the confluence of innovation and manufacturing partners was essential. As with our efforts to produce ventilators, the ongoing production of new test kits would not be possible in New York without having innovative companies and the capacity to make things here. Print Parts in Manhattan is 3D printing swabs, 
and the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in the Bronx is following a CDC protocol to produce transport medium, the liquid that preserves the collected sample when it is transferred to a lab for testing. And in Brooklyn, we've converted a co-working space, CoLab, into a test kit production facility. It's incredible to me that we developed these extremely precise and technologically advanced materials in New York City so quickly. To date, nearly 175,000 test kits have been delivered to h, &H hospitals and clinics, nursing homes, and community testing sites. When the first completed kits were making their way off the production line, cheers erupted in the facility. It's incredibly inspiring to see how New Yorkers are stepping up to support New Yorkers. And you will hear from some of them today. I am proud of the work that's happening across the city. It highlights my core belief that innovation, science, and New Yorkers working together will get us through this. I know you all share this belief. With the phased reopen underway, the hard work is only just beginning. There are many pieces to consider, childcare, transit, how and when we return to our offices, and later to other public venues. All of this aiming to address the bigger question of how we restore vitality to the city we love. The efforts I've highlighted, face shields, gowns, bridge ventilators, and test kits, have done two really important things for the city. The first is providing our frontline workers with the supplies and protective equipment they need to fight this disease and keep the city moving. The second is bringing people back to work with these efforts, creating and preserving almost 3,000 jobs. Almost 60% of gown manufacturers qualify as MWBEs. At CoLab, where test kits are being assembled, they have rehired their staff and are hiring restaurant workers from the Bushwick area. And while these efforts produce a glimmer of hope, it's only a drop in the bucket. New York is facing the greatest economic crisis since the Great Depression. The unemployment numbers we see are staggering. In a matter of weeks, New York City went from nearly full employment to 1.3 million New Yorkers filing for unemployment benefits. And the mayor has noted that the city is projected to lose $9 billion in tax revenues this fiscal year. I don't need to remind this committee of the financial straits that we find ourselves in. On top of all of this, this crisis has laid bare even more starkly that inequalities exist within our city, access to healthcare, food, and broadband, among many others. The events of this past month have shown the systemic racism and injustice that exists within our city and across the nation. People are calling for equity and an end to systemic justice, injustice and police brutality which at an alarmingly high disproportionate rate affects black Americans. And words are not enough. We must act and hold ourselves accountable. At EDC, we have taken a series of steps to put equity more at the center of our work. Internally, we are aggressively ramping up recruitment and hiring efforts to diversify our workforce and, and are implementing mandatory all staff trainings on race and equity. Externally, we must take another look at how our work addresses these issues. Right now, we are undertaking a very intentional internal effort to guide us on this area over the next few months. The process in recovery will be far from easy and the road ahead will be a long one. The city cannot do it alone. There are only so many tools we can use. And that's why the federal government must take bold action and do more. We need real economic relief. We need a stimulus package that supports states and cities and provides the resources needed for robust recovery. Our small businesses, which are the backbone of our economy and neighborhoods, have been shuttered for weeks. Our incredible restaurants, local retailers, small nonprofits, and cultural institutions are what draw people to New York. Tourists, immigrants, people from all over the world. And small businesses are taking the brunt of this. And it just won't be possible for the city to give them the support they need until the federal government steps up with further relief. PPP is just the tip of the iceberg of what's needed. We now need to look beyond maintaining pay payrolls and towards what businesses will need to be able to restart successfully. This includes additional, more flexible capital. The federal government must do more. And I know that EDC, those on this call, and other officials will continue to push for action and hold federal leaders accountable for their action or inaction. And as we advocate for more federal resources, we must ensure that a recovery is equitable and inclusive of all. Returning to the way things were in the past is not good enough. We must create a new normal. 
Economic development has an important role to play. Working with this committee, we must continue to invest in initiatives that bring good paying jobs to all New Yorkers and ensure they have the skills to get those positions, keep them and excel in them. Advanced manufacturing, tech, cyber, life sciences, garment manufacturing and fashion opportunities uh, create an opportunity to diversify our economy while providing New Yorkers with real chances to attain a greater level of economic stability and success. It's a tall order, but I am confident the city will come through this stronger than before. And to anyone who doubts that, just remember the, short, the stories that I shared earlier. Only in New York City can you develop a ventilator in less than a month or na nasopharyngeal swabs within weeks. New Yorkers make the impossible possible, and we will continue to do it over and over. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I now welcome any questions you have. Thank you, President Patchett. Next, we will hear questions from Chair Vallone. Panelists, please stay unmuted if possible during this question and answer period. Chair Vallone, please begin. Uh, thank you, Alex, and thank you, President Patchett. First, let me also acknowledge my fellow council members who have joined us. I mentioned before council members Kuwa and Chaka, but we've also been joined by council members Lander, Aaron, Par Powers, Lewis, and Joni. So if anyone else jumps in, just, just let us know and we'll get you acknowledged. I also realize there are numerous hearings going on, including budget and other hearings. So council members, as you raise your hands, I will get to you as quickly as possible and defer time so you can come and go between those hearings. I know we are, we've got a lot to do in a week to get it done. But let me just start with some generalities and then I'll turn it quickly to the council members and then I'll come back. Um, President Patchett, thank you. I mean, I couldn't be more proud of being chair of this committee and working with you. Um, today really was a chance and is a chance to give that story to be heard because so many good things get lost in today's news and the negative that seems to surround everything we do, that the city really is stepping up and that's probably true testament to where our numbers are today composed to other states. Um, and I understand Governor Cuomo just issued a, a ban of folks from other states with high numbers coming into New York today. Boy, how, how that switched in the last couple of months. We couldn't go anywhere and now we're so safe that, that folks. And I think a big part of that is based on a testimony that you gave today. So what, what, let's start with those overwhelming local success stories and I guess now that we've gone from phase one to phase two, how you envision that partnership now in phase two as we go to phase three? You mentioned the thousands of jobs that we started from with face shields and gowns and bridge ventilators and test kits uh, and the companies that we've worked with the local manufacturers and the biotech companies. Where do you see that relationship with EDC now that we're in phase two and as we prepare for phase three? Great. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, it is. It really looks like you're in the council chambers, which is impressive, <laughs> I must say. Um, At least in the top half. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so, so in any event, um, uh, I think we have been very fortunate to have amazing partners in this effort. Uh, it's been um, it's been remarkable, and many of uh, many of those partners are joining us on this call today, and we'll have a chance to testify later. Uh, to us, we have to recognize that we've made tremendous progress, but that we can't guarantee we're through to the other side of this. So that means that we need to continue to keep vigilant about what is going to be necessary to see this city through to the other side. And we certainly can't be caught short again on PPE or other critical items to get us uh, to make sure our medical workers are protected. So each of those items, um, gowns, face shields, testing kits, we continue to we intend to continue to produce, uh, in some cases at lower scales over time, to ensure that we have a, a manufacturing capacity in New York City uh, to make sure that we're protected, and also make sure we're seeing the important ancillary ben benefits of seeing our own people employed in those opportunities. So how can we how can we enhance that? Right. So if there are companies in New York City or those that are restarting and finding themselves in a perplexing situation that the business that they once did um, may not be where it was pre-COVID crisis. So I find one of our most critical roles today is assisting since we opened on Monday 
the first phase and as businesses come back, I, I find us in a, in a unique opportunity to assist in that new crisis, so to speak, in that new rush to get our folks back to being employed and getting our businesses to open and stay open and then transition. So, so many of these may be opportunities that they didn't know existed. So maybe we can expand on EDC's role with small business as we employ these over 3,000 uh, employees to with the new COVID demand type of jobs, how do you envision that we can now take that next step, expand that number and reach to even more businesses? Well, I think, I think we have learned uh, that being able to make things in New York City is absolutely critical. I mean, you know, at EDC, we've been investing in these sectors for some time because you know, we believe in garment manufacturing in New York City. We believe that we need to have innovation in New York City and we need to be able to make things in New York City. And that's why we've been making these investments. Uh, and so I think this just underscores the importance of that. It emphasizes the need for us to double down on our local manufacturers. Um, and so as an example of that, how can we make sure that our local manufacturers are connected to, to small businesses to be the ones who are supplying them with their PPE, as opposed to them struggling to find it uh, you know, on the internet from an unreliable source. How can they go directly to a local small business and find access to that PPE? I think that's an opportunity to expand this effort and also make sure that it doesn't just, it's not just benefiting hospital workers who are certainly critical and our first concern, but that it's also benefiting small businesses and ensuring that they have access to the items that they need. Yep, that's great. I think getting that pipeline from manufacturing to the companies is a great idea. Um, what about now that we're in phase two? How do you see EDC's role change from phase one, which is really getting the critical equipment and survival mode, to now that in phase two? And when do you think we may transition to phase three? Well, you know, I think that the key now is to is to be focusing on how do we make sure that the city opens as quickly as possible in a safe way? Um, I think you know, safety has to be at the core of all of this because the, we certainly need to do everything we can avoid, again to avoid uh, a second wave. Uh, I mean, there are certain things that are outside of our control, but taking things slowly, gradually, being, being smart about it is going to be really critical to our overall, uh, our overall efforts here. You know, EDC's role in this, I think the thing that we've learned over the last few months is we didn't even know what the next challenge was going to be, but we are prepared to tackle all of them. One of the things that we have been heavily involved in and which we'll continue to be involved in is conversations uh, with about treatments um, and potential ways to connect our academic medical institutions to, uh, to our test and trace efforts getting more possible, more possible ways for people not just to have, uh, not just to uh, be tested as we've been doing with the test kits, but also access to new and innovative treatments that might be able to help them get through the other side of this. Uh, we also need to continue our efforts around thinking about how we can provide all the support we need to our businesses. You know, we've been engaging regularly with businesses, big and small through our sector councils and also through direct conversations one of the things that we're very focused on right now is the need to tell the story of New York City. I think New York City is, you know, has has obviously taken a hit from a uh, from an international perspective. People think of New York City as the epicenter of this virus, and it couldn't be further from the truth right now. You know, I was I'm, as I, I said earlier today, I'm actually planning to go out to dinner tonight, and I'm really looking forward to that. You know, New Yorkers all around are out there living a normal New York City life with a mask. They're being careful, they're being thoughtful, but New York is, a, is still a great place to live. Uh, and it's time for the rest of the world to re be reminded of that story and see the incredible resilience of New York City and where we are today. And so I think that's gonna be a really critical part of reminding the rest of the world that New York City is not just the fabulous city that you knew it was, but also the most resilient city and also a more equitable city as we come to the other side. Well, you're, you're exactly right. Someone asked the two of us, what do we see as the first steps in a panel we spoke at? And we said, New Yorkers will lead the show and show the way. Because in order for us to start generating that income and get tourism and get folks to feel comfortable, New Yorkers have to take that step. Just like you're going to dinner tonight, 
and my wife and I celebrating our anniversary and going back out with the family is so important to show that we are back and that, yeah, the, the, the numbers are low. And when we can show New York City enjoying New York City again and leading the way with changes, just like we're doing here at the council, then I think folks will come. Um, one thing I wanted to ask, and I'm gonna, I see that council members Ku uh, and Barron and Menchaca have the hands raised. So I'll, I'll turn over to Alex to get to them is the tremendous success that for a small amount of money, I know you started the small business grant and EDC started with 5 million to small businesses or companies under a hundred people. And that was exhausted pretty quickly. And I see as we're talking about at least a $9 billion budget, these, these critical lifelines, I like to call them, that the small businesses are looking for, especially as they're just reopening this week, I think will be real ways to make an impact. Do you see EDC expanding or continuing projects or at least getting additional funding in to a program like the five million for the small business continuity road fund that you started? So we've been partnering uh, very uh, closely with SBS on these efforts. Obviously they are the, <clears throat> they're the administration's pace of talking to small businesses, being out there in the field, having conversations with them. And we wanna be a support to that because it's such an important effort right now. Um, this morning at our board meeting, we had approved a uh, $4 million contribution to Pursuit, which is a CDFI in New York City. Uh, and that $4 million in funding will go to uh, some of the small business corridors that were hardest hit uh, uh, over, the, over the last uh, couple of months. So it's, intent, it's, it's to help businesses get restarted. So we don't, you know, we don't have the level of funds that are necessary for this, but we're going to be using the funds that we have to dedicate them to getting our businesses restarted. Do you find any cooperation now on a state or federal with programs like that, or are we just kind of on our own? Well, I will say, uh, I mean, there, there are there are there there are promising conversations with the the private sector, um, and they have been working with the federal government. Uh, the state uh, set up their own hundred million dollar small business loan fund, which is primarily uh, funding from uh, banks with some uh, state uh, state guarantee, which is a similar approach to what the city did earlier on in this process. Um, and so there there is, but I think we all agree that there's just not enough funds. I mean, I know that that loan fund was spoken for very quickly. We have been working uh, with some of our partners in the private sector and the SBA uh, on trying to come up with a new program that, that could be rolled out, uh, which might support smaller businesses. So. You know, there is, notwithstanding the, the Trump administration's challenges, uh, we, there are people who are really trying to do the right things at a lot of these agencies, and those are conversations that we've been having. And I think our role should be to enhance that and coordinate interagency coordination on how to bring that, those links to our small business and to the folks that are yeah. desperately trying to reopen. Uh, and I think that'll be a, a new challenge for phase two and phase three for us to coordinate with the council and ADC those lifelines that are so critical right now while we're negotiating that new budget. So I'd like to turn over to our legislative council, Alex Polinoff, to call on some of the council members to have their hands raised, and then I'll come back with some more questions. Thank you, Chair Vallon. I will now call on council members in the order they have used the Zoom raise hand function. Council members, if you would like to ask a question and you have not yet raised your hand, please do so now. You will have a total of five minutes to ask your questions and receive an answer from the panelists. The Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer and will let you know when your time is up. Once I've called on you, please wait until the Sergeant has announced that you may begin before asking your question. First, we will hear from Council Member Ku, followed by Council Member Barron and Council Member Menchaca. Council Member Ku, please begin. Starting time. Hello? Hi, Hello. We hear you. Council Member Koo, you are currently muted. Will the muter please unmute Council Member Koo? Hello? The new title, the muter. <laughs> Council Member Koo, you're unmuted can now. You, go ahead. Can I, no, okay, you can hear me, right? Thank you. Yes. So thank you, Chair Vallon, and thank you, um, President uh, Patrick 
from EDC. Uh, I have a couple of questions. My first question is, um, during the discussion, uh, your testimony, you mentioned uh, you have ventilator, guns, masks, test kits, all these pieces. Do they receive any subsidy from EDC to, uh, to make all this? Yeah. So the, they're, they're not receiving subsidy. Uh, we are, we are, we have been procuring these items uh, on behalf of the city uh, and paying competitive prices for them. We've been focused specifically on manufacturers uh, that are located in the city of New York, but it's not a subsidy. No, there's no subsidy? No. But they are paying, uh, we are buying stuff from them. Yeah. Okay. So uh, you always mention about equity on small businesses. Uh, there's a big question is, uh, uh, every small business owner uh, uh, tell me, the biggest problem they have uh, is to how to pay rent because the government forced them to shut down for at least three months, some four months, right? And during that, uh, say three months, now they are open. So the landlords ask them for past rent. And, and what's, what's your position? They don't have money to pay the rent. They haven't been, they have been closed for three months. And, and rent though is a lot, it's rather high in New York City. Some small stores in uh, Fashion Ministry cost like $30,000, $40,000 a month just for 2,000 square feet. So three months is like $100,000 there. So uh, how do you help these small business owners? I know you always try and say, oh, we need federal help. Um, but if federal doesn't help, how can the city help? Can you do something like, hey, we stop, we, we maybe we stop the uh, uh, property tax uh, uh, collection for a couple of months so the landlords can uh, forgive uh, partial rent for the for their tenants. Otherwise, property owners told me, oh, they still have to pay tax. They still have to pay all these utilities. And the city's uh, property tax has been increasing. One apartment owner told me his bill has been increased of $150 for every three months. I mean, even during the pandemic, our property tax has been increased. So how do you, answer to these people? Well, I, I, yeah, no, I appreciate the question. Clearly, uh, rent is a huge issue for small businesses. It always has been, but especially when you've been asked to be closed for three months. Um, I, think, I think, you know, the effort the state uh, undertook with the, uh, the freeze on uh, evictions was critical. And it you know, obviously covered commercial tenants as well, but that's not enough. Um, I think landlords who move to evict tenants who are you know, not able to pay all of their back rent, especially small businesses who just don't have the financial capacity to do it are very short-sighted, frankly, especially at this moment in time. But I do acknowledge the, um, you know, the fact that it's not, it's not a simple equation. I mean, just to give you an example, our approach at EDC. So we have over 60 million square feet in the city. We have a substantial number of small businesses in our properties. Uh, we have set up a rent relief committee at EDC. We have gone business by business and had direct conversations with them about what their needs are and how we can get them through to the other side of this. Uh, you, know, I, 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 you know, I can't speak to the overall property tax circumstance of the city. Obviously, that is a you know, complicated question with OMB and DOF. But as far as, as, far as I'm concerned, at a minimum, we, we ourselves as a landlord and others need to be thoughtful about balancing the fact that these businesses are in really hard times while recognizing, of course, they have expenses as well. So what's the solution? Hello? Yeah, what's the solution? Well, James, I, mean, I, yeah. James I know you have in the testimony, you mentioned about the deferral agreements and how you work with folks like at Hunts Point. Maybe yeah. with Councilmember Koo's question, that might be something we can expand on. 
Uh, you're working on rent deferral agreements with Hunts Point and others. Maybe how does that work? Where are we on those and will that be expanded? Yeah, we, we have um, we have had uh, rent deferral agreements, uh, you know, not just in Hunts Point, which is in the Bronx at the food markets, but uh, also uh, with many of our tenants uh, at Brooklyn Army Terminal uh, in Sunset Park with places um, you know, really all across the city, we have tried to be conscious of the economic realities of uh, the circumstances that people are facing. Um, you know, we have been engaging with real estate owners uh, to encourage them to uh, be as flexible as possible because the reality is they're not going to get, uh, you know, they're not going to receive all of their rent. I mean, it's a challenging time. Uh, you know, the city is financially struggling. Small businesses are financially struggling. Uh, landlords are um, going to have to give some. I mean, that's what we've done at EDC, and that's what other real estate owners have to do. I know. I'm talking about small property owners, right? They only have one building, or you no? Know, they, they, their livelihood depend on the income too, because they depend on the rental income, uh, either for the for the uh, mm -hmm. because uh, for the retirement or even when they're young when they're young they need the income to pay the mortgage right and when they even the mortgage pay off they need the income uh to pay a uh, property tax and for the the, the uh, retirement income now all of a sudden it's shut off so it's not fair for, for them to say hey uh you you can you don't have to pay me for three months well, where where is the money coming from you know, yeah. at the end Look, yeah, I know. I absolutely agree. Look, the, the, the reality here is this, the city just does not have the scale of resources that are necessary to address every, every one of these uh, circumstances, which are, I mean, very, very real. And I'm not questioning that at all. In the financial crisis, the federal government ste stepped in. They did modifications of mortgages. Uh, they uh, were creative about the ways that people could repay their mortgages. They provided relief directly to business. I mean, th there needs to be more uh, investment from the federal government, or there are going to be an awful lot of businesses uh, that, that a lot more than are necessary that go out of business. It's, it, honestly, the, the the answer to these has got to be more uh, regulatory relief from the federal government on mortgages, combined with additional resources to uh, businesses. It's the only solution. I think at the minimum, the city can do is have a moratorium on property tax increase uh, uh, during this uh, crisis. But now, right now, I don't know how the city can do it. They usually increase property tax for like uh, property, uh, small apartment owners or commercial buildings. This is, is a bad time. No, you, sh you shouldn't do any increase at all. You should have a moratorium for at least a couple of years. Make, make sure you make that suggestion to our mayor, you know. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member Koo. Mm. We will now hear from Council Member Barron, followed by Council Member Menchaka. Council Member Barron, you may begin. Starting time. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon. I want to thank Councilmember Vallone for calling this hearing. And I wanna thank President Patchett for coming. And I wanna thank all of the people who are working behind the scenes to make this event happen. Uh, President Patchett, you talked about the production of ventilators and gowns and masks and test kits. Are they all being manufactured locally, the ones that we're using or predominantly what percentage and are these companies that already existed or are these companies that have transitioned? Uh, what percentage is it for each of those? Sure, so uh, the, the, the vast majority of all of these items are being made locally. All of the ventilators are being produced, produced locally. Um, of the 3.5 million face shields that we've produced, uh, 2.7 million of those were produced in New York City. Um, of the of the gowns that we've produced, we've produced 3.2 million, uh, 2.8 million of those have been produced by local businesses. Uh, and the test kits are being produced entirely locally. 
Um, just to give you an I don't example. know if anybody else. What's that? Sorry, I missed. And as we didn't hear your question, can you repeat that? I think Councilmember Barron's frozen, but um <laughs> uh Zoom calls. <laughs> Uh, President Patch, if you want to continue what you were saying, then maybe we'd like for her to yeah, come back on. About the masks. I just want to make sure she gets a, if, if she's able, that she's able to hear my response. But yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think um, to, to uh, you know, to address the question, uh, as, as you can tell from those statistics, the vast majority of them are produced locally. These are from, you know, existing businesses. They're employing New Yorkers, um, all, all, all for the, I mean, I think the vast majority of the people with whom we had some form of existing relationship, I mean, like just again, an example, the, uh, the viral transport media is being produced by Albert Einstein College of Medicine in one of their labs. Uh, they had, their lab had been shut down. So they brought their lab team back in to produce. Okay. It. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, a lot of my time got cut because I got some technical difficulties, but my compliments to the staff still remains, still stands nonetheless. In, in your testimony, oh, I'm sorry. In your testimony, you talked about the fact that um, we have to understand that this pandemic is in fact, has highlighted the injustices and the inequities and the racism that exists. So my question is in terms of your structure and your organization, I heard you say that we're doing training and sessions and all of that. If, if we look at the hard data, if we look at the numbers, what percentage of your corporation has Blacks, and I'm saying Blacks specifically, in significant positions that have a managerial or decision-making capacity? Right, and, and I appreciate the question and I understand why you're asking it that way. Um, I don't have the statistics about blacks in front of me, but I will definitely get those to you. And I think that we need to, on a go forward basis, be intentional about how we're thinking about not just people of color, but specifically black New Yorkers and how they're represented. Um, I can tell you that the statistics, uh, you know, we have made real progress on this. In 2015, we were 41% people of color as an organization. We're now 51% on leadership. Uh, we were 30% people of color in senior leadership positions, senior leadership positions, 30% in 2017. As of fiscal 19, we were up to 38%. Uh, uh, and we are continuing to emphasize that. Uh, and, you know, a, you know, I have a, just, just to give you, without a specific statistic, I can tell you that of my team of approximately 20 uh, senior staff members that meet weekly, uh, I believe five of them are black. Okay, uh, follow-up question in that regard or similar to that. Uh, we know that when the pandemic hit and supplies and testing materials were gathered and field hospitals were established, they weren't sent to the neighborhoods that data showed had the greatest number of incidents. The governor sent them to the east side and to uh, Javits Center and to the east side on the, Time's in, expired. the in the Central Park. As this equipment is being manufactured, do you know where it's being distributed? Who's making the requests? Are there independent um, healthcare facilities or where, where are these supplies being sent once they are in fact completed and manufactured? Where are they going? Because the question becomes, Yes, we want to come through this pandemic. And the, the phrase that I'm hearing is we're all in this together, which would make you think that there's some equity and we're all experiencing the same thing when we're not. Some of us are in ocean liners, some of us are in yachts, some are in rowboats, and some are just having a life jacket to try to get through this. So as we talk about coming through this, what role can you play in making sure that the necessary supplies that we need are being stockpiled perhaps in locations that can immediately get them to the black and brown communities that are that are have evidenced the highest incidence 
and that have demonstrated the greatest need rather than waiting to be at the end of the distribution pattern and getting the least and almost the leftover or what yeah. we now have finally caught up to do. So that's my question. Right. What role can you play? At? Can you tell us where your products have been sent? Uh, do you have that information? Who's putting in those requests? Is it just, uh, what are those capacities and what can we look forward in that regard? Okay, that's an important question. And I just wanna acknowledge your totally appropriate statement that although we are all in this together, many of us have significant advantages in the way we're approaching this challenge and others have very few of those advantages. Um, and you're absolutely right. Thank you for stating that very clearly. The, the you know, we have been, uh, primarily producing these these for uh, some of the lowest income areas, uh, specifically our test kits, which are the ones that are being distributed most widely right now. Uh, those are going to uh, directly to health and hospitals, existing clinics and testing sites. Uh, and so, uh, as I as as I know, the council is aware that the, the overall effort from health and hospitals on testing has been to set up in places it, it, targeting specifically the areas that have been hardest hit uh, by the outbreak. And so we are delivering those test kits directly to those neighborhoods for testing to ensure that there are adequate testing supplies in those locations. Uh, and, and to your point, we're also ensuring that we have enough uh, in stockpile so that if, if we need to expand more testing, let's say in September uh, as school restarts, that we have an efficient, sufficient number and that those areas of the city are never gonna be left behind. Thank you. And I just wanna announce for those who may not know, there will be a drive-through testing site in my community located at 888 Fountain Avenue. It will start on Monday. So we wanna make sure we get that information out. Thank you so much and thank you to the chair. Thank, Thank you, you. Councilmember Barron. Uh, we'll now hear from Councilmember Menchaca, followed by Councilmember Jonai. Awesome. Thank Starting you. Good time. And uh, President Patchett, good to see you on this Zoom. Uh, I'm going to get right to it. You mentioned that there's a lack of, uh, I guess, literally just cash. Uh, you're limited into how much you can re reinvest into communities, and you're looking to private sector and other places to kind of bring that investment. Um, are you in the negotiations with the mayor to really ask for that kind of support as things are shifting for uh, and, and a call to restart the economy? And I know we have been working through Sunset Park and Red Hook um, advocacy to really kind of think about uh, and enhance our working waterfronts. Uh, how, what role are you playing to really push the budget so that it brings the investments that we need on the ground. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're candidly, because EDC is, is, is funded separately. Um, I mean, I, I, you know, you're talking about the fiscal 21 budget, which is a major focus right now uh, in the city. We're, we're not in those discussions because it doesn't, it doesn't impact EDC's funding directly. Our funding comes from our tenants, uh, which uh, is that's down for its own set of reasons because we're trying to be accommodating to them. Got it. That's just really important for I think everyone to know and how how we can support EDC as a separate kind of engine of an economy uh, because we are we are headed towards the June 30th deadline and we have to pass a budget and um, yeah. Well, no, thank you. I appreciate that. I will say, I mean, look, I think there's it's going to be a challenging time, and I do think we have the ability to. You know, if, if, if there's financial flexibility and certainly if there's help from the federal government, having resources to put directly into communities to be able to go deeper on, on financial relief, to be able to provide job training opportunities. I mean, I think those are going to be really critical efforts. So I appreciate the focus on well, that. Let's talk about the government, the federal government. Uh, the FDA has, has been approving companies across the country to uh, be part of this larger kind of federal uh, program. And without that, and I guess you, I, I'm going to ask you to talk, kind of talk about the importance of being FDA approved to get those funds so that they can create PPE uh, across the country. What, um, how are you looking at that? Uh, are you helping companies get approved by the FDA? How many FDA approved companies are there in the city of New York? 
and how many of them are MWBs? Right. I don't have I don't have the overall statistics for you, but we can we can get that. I mean, I think the the definition of FDA approval varies a little bit. So in some cases, the specific product needs to be approved. Uh, in some cases, the company needs to be approved. And in some cases, there's actually no FDA standard at all. So just to give gowns for a second, there is no FDA basis for that. So we are working directly with the Department of Health and the, using their standards and then just talking to clinicians about what they need. Um, the, you know, testing kits, again, there's not, there's not an FDA approval. There's an FDA protocol but there is a requirement that the manufacturers be FDA approved. And so we are working with approved FDA manufacturers. As it happens, they were producing Invisaligns before the crisis. So uh, it's just, it, it really varies by the specific circumstance, but we have been helping all of these companies navigate this because it's an incredibly complicated process and you need to be damn sure you get it right. Yeah, and, and I think that's the, that's the point because I think the, the, the question here is, is access to funds. And there's there's a question about city funds right now, your budget, the state budget, the federal budget, and we're waiting for more stimulus down the way, down, down the line. Um, we, we could be uh, preparing our companies right now to get ready to, to connect to all that funding. And so I'm, I'm just really curious if you can speak just a little bit more about how you're focusing on companies getting what they need so that they can have access to multiple sources of, of income um, yeah. including or not income funding from the state and from the federal government. Since we are in a massive hole, we're going to have to right. fill a $10 billion plus dollar hole right now, um, which will include a $1 billion cut to the NYPD uh, and really focusing on communities of color, which also include companies that are MWBE. So that's how we're looking at it. And I'm, I just, I really want to see if there's any orientation around that from EDC to yeah. accomplish that. And, and so, yeah, just speak to that, please. Of course. It is good to see you, by the way. Good to see um, you. <laughs> <laughs> even in this setting. Um, yeah. So, uh, so absolutely. Um, so just the first, like when the first PPP came out, as an example, we called, um, emailed, reached out to every one of our tenants uh, to make sure that they knew about it, had information about how to apply, uh, and and a lot of them got it in, but you know that first round of PPP, it all was spoken for by basically within a day. Then there was another round. Uh, a lot of them did a lot better on that round, um, but that's just our tenants. What we have been finding with other tenants, uh, it, it just in general, small businesses across the city, these programs are really hard to access. You, I mean, you need to, you, you, you almost literally need someone to fill out the application for many of these businesses. There are, there are, language barriers, which obviously we're very aware of in New York City. Uh, there are digital, uh, digital divide issues. Um, so I think what we have, have to do as much as possible, and this is something we had a, actually had a lengthy discussion yesterday with the Chambers of Commerce and the different, uh, in all five boroughs. How can we get more boots on the ground to be going business to business to actually have conversations with people and say, these are the resources that are going to be available and that are available this is the piece of paper. Give me these three pieces of information and we will sign up for you. Okay, I, I, my time is over, but I, I think we, we should just keep talking about that and yeah. really monitor that work. And I know there's one company that uh, is on my list of, of just back to stories. You're talking about how, we, how do we tell a story? Yeah. Um, and uh, the, the the owner is named Arturo, and he has storytellers and creators. Uh, he's his company in the Navy Yard. Uh, he just moved there, and he's employing a whole bunch of uh, uh, New Yorkers on the ground, new jobs. And so there's just the really beautiful stories that are on the ground that I think we can keep telling. So thank you for the work, and looking forward to talking to you more about how we focus on impacted uh, COVID-impacted communities as we get the economy up and running. Thank you, Travis. Thank you. And we should say, since since uh, Councilmember Barron did, that we also have a, a, a drive-through test site at your district at uh, Brooklyn Army Terminal, which we've set up together. So uh, it's very easy to get tested. Get tested. Thank you for that plug. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Menchaca. We will now hear from Councilmember Jonai. Starting time. Hi, do you hear me? Yes, we hear yes. you. 
Thank you. Um, I'm actually calling in. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't get to a Zoom. Um, President Patchett, thank you so much. I heard you mention earlier uh, Yeshiva. Um, is this the biotech funding that you were referring to, or is that a separate funding? Did I mention Yeshiva? Maybe yes. Einstein? Yeah, no. I think Albert Einstein, Einstein I mentioned. Albert Einstein, correct. Yeah. Yeah, I did. Yeah, no, Albert Einstein, the, the School of Medicine. Um, yeah, we we're working uh -huh. with, with them to to produce uh, viral transport media in their labs for our test kits. So it's, it's actually an amazing effort. They have been incredible partners. I know they're in your district. Right. Yes, they are. Thank you for that. And they are also uh, recipients of a biotech award of $11.6 million that I believe you're familiar with that has been tangled up. And this is the Montefiore portion of it, but it's all part of the same campus, as you can only imagine, between the merger between Montefiore and Einstein. Or are you aware of that? And I believe they've been in touch with you on how to unravel this log jam of freeing up this much needed funding. Yeah, we, we have certainly, I mean, that's the impetus for our initial relationship with them, absolutely, is their... Uh... Is you know is there a response to one of our uh, one of our efforts to do more uh, you know more production of uh, uh, bio uh, you know biotech wet labs in the city and particularly R and D applied R and D in New York City and we had they are part of a they they responded to an RFP along with several other respondents uh, there's fifty million dollars of funds overall we have been in conversation with them as well as several others uh, and we hope to be making awards soon. My understanding is that they actually qualified for 11.6 million of that. Well, well they're, 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 yeah, we have been in, we have been in conversations with them uh, and several others about uh, about how to allocate that funding. I mean, no, it's it's 50 million dollars overall. My understanding again, President Patchett is that they have been qualified, pre-qualified for $11.6 million of that, which would make, establish them as a New York leader in life science, innovation, and research and development, something that we all aspire to do for the, for the city of New York, and in particular, uh, the borough of the Bronx, where we could really use the assistance. This was uh, something well received, but yet we find ourselves months later um, in a logjam of technicalities, and this is the problem with bureaucracy. Government is great, and so you give them a project because they'll figure out a way to make it complicated. President Patchett, please free up that money for them so we can help the left. By the way, the work that they could have been working on would be uh, that could have addressed COVID. Coming up with um, uh, a uh, something to the uh, combat the virus itself, and with the lien payments to them. And that leads me into my next segue, because I don't expect you to answer that question, except that you're going to say, we're working on your continued dialogue, and I got it. We, your economic development, when, when, when we think of economic development, well, our small businesses in particular are hoping that we get more from you and the EDC in the form of investments, loans and grants, get us back up on our feet. Uh, to hear economic reports from the EDC and sit on the sideline, and I, with all due respect, I, 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 I'm saying this in a fashion where um, it's not to undermine your hard work, but understanding the task that you have ahead of you. To sit on the sidelines and watch our small businesses collapse and wait for this measure to correct themselves with private landlords, which are another small business, to step up to the plate or to wait for federal government to do its part is not a solution to the existing problem. President Patchett, we've seen the, before COVID, our commercial corridors were experiencing large number of vacancies. Every small business that closes has an impact on our bottom line. They no longer contribute to our tax base. They don't employ locally. We can't afford for a small business to close. They're changing and we need to do more to assure that they have an opportunity to reopen and rethink their business models out to adapt to this changing world. What can we expect from you to do this? Great, thank you for the question. Um, first, 
I just want to uh, reiterate, we, uh, to your first point, we, we really appreciate the relationship. Right. We really appreciate the relationship with Montefiore. We've been working closely with them. Um, happy to follow up offline. I, I just, uh, I don't accept your characterization of where they are in the process, but uh, I'm sure that's how they're characterizing it. Um, but we do appreciate their, uh, them and we want to work with them. Um, <clears throat> Uh, as you know, as to the broader issue of small businesses, uh, I, I, you know, I couldn't agree more. This is a critical issue. I just want to acknowledge first, we're not sitting on the sidelines. We're acknowledging the fact that there's simply not going to be enough resources in New York City to address it. What, 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 what you're saying, and I think is correct, is that there is a significant financial gap being experienced by uh, small businesses and their ability to pay their rent. And by extension, landlords, in many cases, small landlords, who if they're not getting their rent, are struggling to pay their mortgage. What I'm telling you is that the depth of that financial impact, even if it's just three months, which is, it's gonna be more than that, um, is substantial and way beyond the ability of the city to cover it. it. Doesn't mean we can't do anything. It means we need to do things like working with the state to ensure that tenants get rent relief, the tenants, uh, the tenants have the ability to stay in place. We come up with creative legislative solutions uh, to preclude landlords from uh, short-sightedly kicking out businesses just because they can't pay a couple of months of back rent. Uh, and we need to provide the level, uh, you know, we need to work with small business services. I know you're the, the chair uh, to, to get them to, uh, you know, provide on the ground support to the maximum extent possible. And we're prepared to help uh, to those businesses. Uh, I mean, I think uh, what we have done directly with our tenants uh, where we have direct control is to be as you know, on the ground as uh, di working directly with them as possible to meet them where their needs are. I completely agree with you. It's a crisis for small businesses and we can't afford to sit on the sidelines. Thank you for that. But you, here we go again. More specifically, besides uh, uh, letting them know of the programs that are available, the PPE funding, uh, and perhaps helping them, and I, I understand that you're trying to work with helping them. So you're really not doing out their applications for them. Uh, if they're not your tenants, you may not be giving all small all small business the same opportunities as economic development, as the EDC for the city of New York. You again spun it back to saying, well, you know, we pass rigid regulations to prevent um, evictions. Well, that's great. Uh, we, we're, we're helping them. We're working with the state. Well, well that's great. Uh, we're working with SBS. Well, well, that's great. What is the EDC doing to assure that every small business in our commercial corridors will have a chance to reopen? Tell me what program you have in place, what funding you have in place, what resources you have in place, not to pass it to the next guy. And I say that knowing that we have a good working relationship, we've done some great things together, and I expect to do more, but they're holding my feet to the fire. I need to hold your feet to the fire. This is what government's supposed to do. We're supposed to be proactive, not reactive. And in a time of crisis, we're supposed to pool resources together and deliver. We're not delivering. President Thatcher, we're not even removing some of the basic regulations off of the burdens of these small businesses now that were struggling with those regulations prior. We still have a commercial rent tax. In this climate in Manhattan, with the highest vacancy rates ever, we haven't removed the vacancy, the uh, rent tax on them because they're located in an, a geographic area. Real estate taxes increase, no decrease. What are the sewer rates? I know this is a difficult situation that we're in. What can we walk away from with today that I can say President Patchett is committed and here's what he's got on his hand in his hands and has pledged to do to assure every small business has a fighting chance what can i walk away with from this hearing to to deliver to my small businesses our small businesses fair enough um so first off you know i, I certainly welcome your ideas uh, i just want to again reiterate there is a 
huge financial challenge here, a staggering financial challenge. Uh, and um, what we have done directly with our tenants, again, is to relieve their rent uh, and be as flexible as possible as we can with them and work with them directly. That's not every business in the city, for sure. For the rest of the businesses, uh, we, this morning at our board, approved an additional round of relief in partnership with the local CDFI, funding to go to directly to some of the hardest hit uh, business corridors in partnership with this organization, Pursuit. Uh, it's $4 million to be paired with uh, private capital to go to small businesses. We're working directly, with, as I mentioned, uh, with the SBA to try to establish a new program that would help, uh, help small businesses uh, across the city access a different type of funding. These are the types of efforts we're working on, and we're going to work directly with those businesses and the chambers of commerce to make sure that they have access to the resources. If, if what they're looking for is money from EDC, I am not going to be the source of that. I'm going to be honest with you about that. We don't have the resources to do that. We are helping our tenants and the conversations about property taxes and other issues. I understand those. I understand the complexities of those. I have to acknowledge the city is already facing a $9 billion shortfall, but we need to be we need to be having those discussions, uh, and I recognize the importance of them. So, President Patchett, I, I thank the council members. The only one I see, and I've reached out, is Council Member Brad Lander. I see you walking. Brad, do you have any questions for um, our crew, or do you want me to? Continue? I do, yes. Perfect. Let me, uh, yeah, let me pause and roll. Uh, yeah, all right. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Uh, thank you, Chair Malone, and uh, thank you, President Patchett, for being here. Um, and I, I really want to honor and appreciate the work that you and a lot of folks you helped organize did, especially in those days when PPE was in such short supply. Um, you know, I got a chance to, to talk to uh, David Ehrenberg about what was going on at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, and I know what you did and what you organized people to do it was really um, uh, significant, like part of the frontline essential, more heroic work. And I appreciate it. And I think it speaks to the need to preserve our manufacturing and industrial capacity, a thing that I know you and I share and that we pushed uh, on a lot. Um, the question that I, I want to ask you at, the, at this time publicly, I've asked you privately as well, and it speaks to the recovery issues. Um, I'm really concerned uh, about the $1 billion in cuts to EDC's capital budget that are proposed by the mayor in the executive budget. Uh, to the Neighborhood Development Fund, to just a whole array of your investment programs um, that are job creating, the whole point of which, like you focus on uh, 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 women and minority owned businesses, you focus on low income communities, communities of color, uh, and to take a billion dollars out of the four year capital commitment plan and push it out into the next capital commitment plan right at the time when our women and minority owned businesses are devastated when our neighborhoods need investment and we've lost hundreds of thousands of jobs. It just doesn't make any sense to me. And I know, you know, OMB makes a set of decisions about the capital budget, which I have to say broadly, it's $2.3 billion in cuts altogether, a half billion to affordable housing. But the largest single agency is yours, a billion dollars in cuts. Um, you know, and I, I guess I'm imagining you'll respond with something like the OMB response, which is, there were time delays caused by the COVID crisis that pushed those projects back and we're just recognizing reality, but that is not what this budget does. Eliminating the Neighborhood Development Fund is not about projects that were delayed. That was about funds that are supposed to be committed. This should be a time to, you're investing more capital. That's like Keynesian economics say, the counter cyclical thing that we can do is invest capital smartly in equity positive job generating activities. So. Isn't it a terrible idea to cut a billion dollars from your budget out of the current capital commitment plan? And what are you doing instead to invest more money in our communities and our in the industry and our job creating infrastructure? Yeah, um, thank you for the question. Good to see you. Looks like you're right outside City Hall. Um, I, I am indeed. Yeah. Uh, you'll, 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 <laughs> um, <laughs> So anyway, so it's, it's good to see you. Uh, so I, I, I moved, would say I moved I moved away from the Occupy uh, okay. demonstration just so it would, you know, wouldn't interrupt our hearing. Okay, thank you. 
Um, no, I, I, you know, I, I, I want to acknowledge the important work that you have done along with your colleagues to call out the importance of investing in infrastructure at a time of economic downturn. I mean, you're, you're, you're right uh, as a student of Keynesian economics that it's incredibly important to invest in infrastructure in downturns. Uh, and so it's, you know, it's certainly painful for from an economic development perspective to see uh, funding reduced in infrastructure. At the same time, uh, you know, there there are real budget forces on the city, and I, I'm not a, you know, I'm I'm not privy to all of those, and I acknowledge that it's a complicated time. Um, and you know, I I, I want to continue to invest in neighborhoods. I think we want to push and you know, make sure we've been fortunate to have a lot of infrastructure funding uh, moving ahead right now. I had hundreds of millions of dollars of projects approved by board this morning and we're gonna keep pushing to do infrastructure because uh, getting the dollars out quickly and getting them in particular, as you referenced, MWBEs uh, out to uh, you know, businesses that are based in New York, which is certainly a thing that construction can do. Uh, that's a really important effort right now. So I guess, look, I understand you don't make the budget decisions. OMB makes the budget decisions. But I guess for the record, you know, can you tell us some of what the billion dollars that was in the capital commitment plan for EDC prior to the executive budget and that now is not in there was going to buy in investments that we are now not going to have if that version of the budget is what is adopted? Um. I don't. I don't have the specific uh, details of, or you know, by that extension. But you're. I mean, the capital budget was reduced significantly for EDC, as you said, close to a billion dollars uh, in neighborhood investments and other things. You know, that being said, you know, it, there is an acknowledgement that it's going to take longer to do capital construction projects uh, right now. I'm, I'm not. And I'm not trying to play a. I'm not trying to play a gotcha game with you and OMB makes the budget decisions and you know I think they're making a bad budget decision because while we must make operating budget cuts we actually don't need to make capital budget cuts we have plenty of room uh, we just uh, issued another billion dollars in bonds that were rated highly by the market one of the lowest interest rates we've ever seen and by every measure even fairly conservative folks like Citizens Budget Commission agree for long-term debt different from short-term but for long-term debt we got plenty of room so but I do, we're not, I guess I'm going to just push you a little more to tell us the kinds of things that we're losing, because I think part of the challenge right now is that people don't understand what are, what we're losing by cutting those dollars. And those are things you would have invested in. So without, I'm not trying to get you on the hook for, you know, uh, against OMB, but if you could just for the record, help us understand what we're going to be spending broadly, if you can't give specific projects, a billion dollars less on if those cuts go through. I just think that's important for the council as part of our due diligence as we're finalizing a budget um, to, to have a clear understanding on so that if we wanna push hard to restore some of that investment because we think it's important, we're a little clearer than it's possible to be with the inf information that we have. Right, I appreciate that. So the, the single most significant change was in the neighborhood development fund, which is a, a pool of capital that is intended to be invested in um, neighborhoods that are experiencing, uh, you know, meaningful growth and have infrastructure needs as a part of that. So what does that mean? It means, um, in some cases, improvements to sewers, roads, uh, sometimes park improvements, kind of across the board, community comprehensive infrastructure investment. It really varies by community. Uh, you know, we, we remain in conversations with OMB. Um, I know the council certainly is. Uh, uh, is, is the ability to move infrastructure projects ahead has been challenged by a variety of things. Uh, you know, obviously COVID is, is, is a big, it's a big challenge. And we had a lot of projects that were just paused by virtue of the, the state order for the last three months. Um, but as we're starting to ramp things up, uh, you know, welcome the continued conversation about how we can get more of those infrastructure projects. Moving. And I'll, so I'll just close out here and I'll just say this more to my colleagues than to you. Uh, you know, if what was cut was kind of, uh, uh, genuinely a delay, you know, like three months out of the remaining uh, year and a half or, you know, I guess, no, not. And I mean, the four-year capital commitment plan still has another uh, three and a half years in it. So three months out of, you know, three and a half years would be less than 10% uh, cut, but your budget has taken a 40% cut to its, uh, to its capital and uh, HPD similarly over the next two years. So 
I just want to say to the chair and to my colleagues, as we are finalizing the budget, while we are rightly focused on the operating budget and the many issues that are involved there, um, we should not forget the capital budget, which is a separate budget in which we have plenty of room and walloping EDC's capital budget by a billion dollars and HPD's budget by 500 million is a terrible uh, decision from the point of view of a, of a thoughtful, just, vibrant, equitable recovery. So I, I hope we'll just use this information that uh, President Patchett has given us in our budget negotiations to fight hard for the kinds of investments. And I'll, I'll even expand to kind of loop in a little of what Council Member Jonai said. I think there might be ways, you know, obviously a lot of that money does go to MWBEs in construction. It is, a, it's not only small business support because it is the kind of infrastructure investments that President Patrick talked about, but a lot of it is small business investment. A lot of the investments CDC makes create new commercial real estate spaces that are affordable for small businesses in ways that very little else is. So this is one thing the council should be pushing on. So thank you. Uh, uh, President Patrick for uh, talking to me about it. And Mr. Chair, thank you for the time. Thanks for everything you're doing. Good to see you. Thank you, Council Member Lander. And you know what, President Patrick, the, the council members that are part of this committee fought to be on this committee. And we are your allies in this budget process. So what Council Member Lander said is, is true. We need EDC to be fully operational, to continue to be the rudder for the city's giants shift that we are and any cuts the capital budget has residual effects that we just don't want so we will fight with you that's what we are here on this committee for so i, I thank councilman Lander for saying that and, and councilman jonah and chaka and, and baron and everyone that stated because we know and that's why today's hearing was so important and to the folks that are, are waiting to testify, uh, President Patchett and I are, are, are wrapping up and then your questions will be answered um, almost in the next few minutes, so hang in there. But I, I, I want to echo those efforts. We need to really prioritize and focus as we look at the cuts in the budget. Any cut to you has a 10, total, 10 times effect to the, to the workforce development, to the capital projects, to the neighborhood projects, to the WMBEs, to the minority owned businesses and and that's why we need to stand up so we will be your allies in this and i know today's not the day but if there is a budget um outlook for operational changes i guess kindly let's let's ramp that up now because the budget's going to be voted on within the next week so whatever we can do to assist you on making sure those cuts are as minor as possible um we're allies on that is there anything else you want to expand on the, on the budgetary front that you're facing with this year's budget i mean uh, it's it's a challenge for everyone i mean i think we'll see what comes out uh, i think you know i recognize the city is in a challenging financial time uh and we're just trying to do our best to be a part of the a part of the solution by getting the economy going well, one of the things that, and I'll just want to close on, as we talk about social distancing and folks getting back to work and the concerns between uh, MTA being able to provide that, you know, you and I have always advocated for the success of the ferry system. Uh, I think it's an important outlet more than ever um, to give folks that additional option while we return to work. So can you give us an update on, on how ferry service is working now? Do you envision any changes in that as we go forward and, and just your work on it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so um, the we had obviously a significant decline in ridership at the at the depths of this. Um, uh, we were uh, but but we have seen a huge surge uh, in ridership over you know, starting with um, uh, starting with phase one reopening uh, and continuing into phase two reopening. Uh, so we have seen uh, you know, huge increases overall uh, in ridership during that time. Our, our, what, we had, what we did, and we worked with the council on this, was to reduce our overall uh, spending for the fiscal year on ferries to try and help uh, save some some fund some much needed funding and we've done that primarily by reducing service uh, and, uh, in during the period of time where we were you know where, where the city was really shut down uh, and we had very low ridership 
but we've been ramping service back up over the last uh, couple of weeks and are going to continue to do that this weekend. Um, at the same time, uh, we did make some permanent adjustments, which make the overall uh, ferry system more efficient uh, and hopefully will uh, have permanent cost savings uh, result uh, impacts, but also will provide a more efficient system for riders. So this was a positive opportunity to, to make some of those changes uh, and hopefully have an overall better outcome for the system. Uh, but collectively, I mean, we know that New Yorkers love their ferries. Uh, they're a really important way of linking uh, New Yorkers from all over the city who are in transit, transit deserts to uh, you know, other, other waterfront areas and to jobs. Uh, and so in this time, as you said, of social distancing, you know, being able to be outside on the top of a ferry vessel is a particularly appealing way to travel. Uh, and we've seen New Yorkers realize that in increasing numbers. Thank you, President Patchy. Before I turn it over to our policy, uh, to our legislative counts, count, Council Alex Bonoff, I know Council Member Robert Cornegie just jumped on. Oh, Robert, if you had any questions before we turn it over to the witnesses who signed up. So if you have any, uh, just, just shoot out to us and then we'll, we'll jump in. At this point, I'd uh, love to thank my staff and as we turn it over to uh, the folks who have been waiting to testify, thank you for your patience. And Alex, over to you. Thank you, Chair Vallone. Uh, we will now turn to public testimony. Uh, I'd just like to note that EDC may remain on the Zoom meeting as we hear from the public. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given two minutes to speak. Please begin once the sergeant has the timer, has started the timer. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the Zoom raise hand function and we will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will set the timer and give you the go ahead to begin. Please wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. I would now like to welcome Marjorie Parker to testify. After Marjorie Parker, we will be calling on Libby Mattern, followed by Scott Denny. Marjorie Parker, you may begin. Starting time. Uh, okay, there you are. I'm on mute. Hey, Marjorie. Hi, I think I'm, oh, I'm great. Thank you for, um, for, for having us. Good morning, everyone. My, name is Marjorie Parker. I am the president and CEO of um, JobSource NYC. Um, JobSource NYC is a workforce intermediary that creates an advanced solution that break down barriers and transform the systems, supporting young adults and their communities in the pursuit of economic opportunities. Uh, we've been working over the last, um, since the pause, to understand the impact uh, and the breadth and depth of COVID-19 um, on the on young adults, their communities, and their organizations that support them. We recently published a report um, called The Early Impact of COVID-19 on the Young Adult Workforce Development System. Um, you should have that um, in your inboxes. Um, you can um, look at that report on our website. Um, informed by the report um, and our 14 years of experience, um, we outlined three recommendations that we think the New York City Economic Development Corporation and the New York City Council um, should consider. One is to invest in place-based solutions. For over a decade, JobSource has taken an intentional place-based um, approach to um, systems transformation, supporting community-led partnerships in the neighborhoods with the highest rates of out of school, out of working adults. And just as the city has done for the restaurant revitalization program, um, restricting it to 27 communities hardest hit by the pandemic, we recommend that the EDC COVID-19 relief efforts are hyper-localized and focus on the communities that suffer the highest rates of infection and death from the coronavirus. So places like Brownsville, for example, where there's a 45% infection rate. Thank you. If, um, 
You know what, Marjorie, if there's additional testimony that you want to submit and the program that you were mentioning, we're happy to pass that around to everyone. But if you'd like to wrap up your, your yes. time. I'd like to wrap up by saying that um, we should prioritize young adults um, and provide immediate uh, support to small businesses as many of those small businesses are the first place of entry for jobs for young people. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ms. Parker. We will now hear from Libby Mattern, followed by Scott Denny, and then Ibrahim Ndoye. Ms. Mattern, you may begin your testimony. Hi all, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm having some slight tech issues, so I'm hoping that I get through this. We can hear you. Very good. I'm Libby Matter and I'm the founder of Course of Trade, and I'm proud to be here today speaking about our COVID-19. Oh, I think we lost her. Job training resource. There you go. Through our partnership with the EDC, Course of Trade has mobilized five factories in South Brooklyn, including That's My Girl, MCM Enterprises, Direct Promotional, Malia Mills, and The Fashion Poet. In these times of unfathomable economic uncertainty, the impact of the city stepping in to partner with factories has been palpable. Through this partnership, we were able to create jobs where there would have been none. This is important for all of us, for all New Yorkers, and together we're providing over 300 jobs in South Brooklyn to produce hospital isolation gowns for the city. By the end of June, next Tuesday, we will have shipped over 500,000 gowns in just about two months. What's been really beautiful to see is a sense of community and family that's been born from this program. Malia Mills was able to work with SBIDC and the Center of Family Life to hire new sewers to help with this program. One sewer hired brought her husband on board to help. Another brought her daughter, another brought her brother, and another brought two sisters and a brother-in-law. And the emotional impact of finding strength and helping family and neighbors not only access much needed work, but also create vital PPE has been immensely powerful. And I think what's also critical to note about this program is the very real financial impact it had on the factories. The influx of work by way of isolation gowns through our partnership and contract with the EDC has been means of financial stabilization for factories in these very uncertain times. I can say this for sure. New York City garment manufacturing is absolutely critical for the economic health of the city and the country as a whole. We have incredible and immensely knowledgeable workforce right here in our five boroughs. And ensuring the longevity of this pipeline of sewers is mission critical as we weather this economic storm. Time's here expired. Okay. Again, Libby, no problem, finish up. Okay. Um, the, the erosion of this manufacturing base risks jeopardizing a vital economic ecosystem. Through ongoing workforce development, we can continue to ensure that there is a broad and deep pool of talented makers who can remain the beating heart of fashion in New York City. And I believe this model of pu public slash private collaboration, if continued, can have a catalytic effect in stabilizing the labor market in this vibrant but volatile sector and ensure the longevity of this important facet of our city's economy. And the commitment to workforce development to New York City manufacturing by the EDC shows vision, not only in providing essential protective gear to our frontline workers and first responders, but also by seizing the opportunity to help fortify a pillar of New York's economy. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mattern. Next, we will hear from Scott Denny, followed by Ibrahim Ndoye, and then Adina Levin. Mr. Denny, you may begin your testimony. Starting time. All right, can you guys hear me? I'll go ahead if you, I hope yes. you hear me. We can hear you. I'm Scott Denny. I'm uh, the uh, Director of Marketing and Sales at Gary Plastic Packaging. Um, we've been a full service manufacturer in the New York City since 1963. Um, it's a union workforce uh, with a collective bargaining agreement going back more than 50 years. Um, our primary business is plastic packaging and sports bottles. That's what we make. We don't make PPE until this thing started. Um, our facility is in Hunts Point, 300,000 square feet, and we've been working with EDC since 1998 on um, lots of things. Um, the COVID-19 really dramatically dropped our business. It was very much reduced. Um, so the orders and the contracts that we've had from EDC have really helped us. Um, They've provided orders. Uh, so far, we've shipped um, 750,000 of the face shields for New York City hospitals, and we're contracted to make another 750,000 more 
in, um, in July. I brought one, this is what it looks like. Um, we, um, we make drinkware, we make sports bottles, so we're, we follow good manufacturing processes, we make packaging for um, medical devices, so we've been registered with FDA uh, for a long time. Um, so we were able to set up production lines fairly quickly. We were able to do the die cutting and the assembly. Um, it's not what we usually do, but we have the equipment, so we were able to set it up. Um, and we're also able, because we, we print on our sports bottles, we can pass everything through a UV light that helps kill the bacteria to ship it as clean as possible. Um, so these face shields, it's pretty simple. It's four pieces. It's a, it's a plastic shield, it's a foam pad, it's an elastic strap, and it's a label. Um, in normal times, we'd be able to shop for the best value and... Um, it's okay, nope. finish, finish up. Yeah. Finish up. So the, the big orders we got from um, EDC helped us in three ways. Uh, first, we were able to purchase in, in volume to get a good deal. Um, not so much a good deal, but availability. Stuff was scarce three months ago, so we weren't able to get it, and um, having that buying power helped us a lot. Um, second, we were able to scale up much better than we would have, and most importantly, we don't have a distribution network to get this stuff to hospitals. Um, we could make it, but we didn't have people to sell it, and shipping it all to a big warehouse so you guys could distribute it to the best places, that was really helpful. And um, we're planning to keep making these, and... Um, if the orders all stop, we could start up and make a million more of them in eight weeks if, um, if needed in, um, in September. And we've added 75 jobs just for this product, um, but indirectly it's helped so much more than that. The people in this building are really, really proud to be part of this effort. And, um, you know, even a small part, it makes them feel very happy. So thanks for having me. I really enjoyed listening to your whole conversation. Um, and that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Denny. Next, we will hear from Ibrahim Ndoye, followed by Adina Levin and Sam Perovi. Mr. Ndoye, you may begin. Starting time. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and member of the committee. My name is Ibrahim Mendoy, and I'm the director of, and partner of, of HD Fashion Inc. It's a high-end garment manufacturing company based in New York City Garment Center. Thank you so much for, for the opportunity to testify today. In mid-March this year, when the COVID began to spread like anyone else in New York City, we were extremely concerned about our safety the safety of our loved one and the safety of the city as a whole. Though we're an expert in the production of PPE, we wonder how we could be of service of New York City during this crisis. After extensive search and in, in trial, we were confident that we could actually produce the, high, the gun at a high level. So we then reached out to the EDC team to collaborate with them and they provided us with all the resources and support we needed to be successful. We officially started the production process in May 1st, and by June 6, HD Fashion and the network of 20 small business partners, we ship and produce over 420,000 gallons to New York City Hospital. So the project has made a, such a major impact for all of us. It allows us to give back to New York healthcare workers, and at the same time, it preserves and created job at a single business for every single business that was involved in this process. So we would like to thank the entire EDC team under the leadership of Jen Pashet for giving us the opportunity and most importantly for the trust he made on us to make this project happen. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ibrahim. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Ndoye. We will now hear from Athena Levin followed by Sam Perovi. Ms. Levin, you may begin. Starting time. Hi, I'm Adina Levin. I'm the CEO of CoLab, a WBE certified company here in New York City. And um, it's a pleasure to be addressing all of you today. I was asked by NYCEDC to give a brief overview of the work that we've been doing in collaboration with EDC to produce the COVID-19 test kits. And um, I wanna start by saying that this has been one of the most rewarding 
and productive experiences of my professional career. From the first call with EDC eight weeks ago, um, where they introduced to us the grand mission that they had in mind to make COVID-19 test kits here in New York City to producing more than 60,000 kits a week, the project has been a seamless collaboration with our partners at EDC, Einstein Medical, and Print Parts. It, it has literally been a case study in execution. From the get-go, um, all of the distractions that typically masquerade themselves as critical were shoved to the side where they belong. And the focus became singular. Produce COVID-19 test kits in New York City and send them to the hospitals and clinics that needed them the most. That's it. That became the singular mission. And it defined every action, every decision, every conversation from that point forward. And that common vision propelled us as a team to transform from a non-existent enterprise to a fully operational medical supply company in three weeks. And so now we're here and I'm talking to you and sharing how four groups that had never worked together built a medical supply company that's now delivering 60,000 kits a week, which to give you a sense of scope represents 20% of all tests administered in the state of New York. And to my knowledge, this has not been done anywhere else in the country. I'm really proud of the work that we've all done together. At CoLab, this project has created 24 new jobs that pay on an annualized basis $52,000 a year. And we're able to hire some of the city's most hard hit workers directly from the restaurants that had been shuttered because of the pandemic. To date, this group of people has been able to create hundreds of thousands of test kits. We've also been able to keep the 24 people we hired and their families from further financial and emotional suffering as a result of the city having to shut down because of the pandemic. As I said, I'm really proud of the work EDC, Einstein Medical, Print Parts, and we have accomplished together. Not to mention the entire team at CoLab who was hired and trained in three days and who all stepped up and executed at the highest level. This has been the greatest example for me of what happens when a, when a mission is critical and getting the work done is all that matters. Thank you so much for letting me speak today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Adina, for that very inspiring story. You're right, that's the most inspirational work that we can do. So thank you for it. Thank you, Ms. Levin. We will next hear from Sam Perovi, followed by Will C. Mr. Perovi, you may begin your testimony. Starting time. Uh, dear council members, my name is Sam Pierovi. I'm the founder and CEO of Consortium. We're a retail technology startup based in New York City's Meatpacking District. When the COVID-19 crisis was at its early peak, we reached out to EDC and offered to pool our resources and bring together a sizable production effort, supplying New York City hospitals with face shields. Within a few weeks of that initial outreach, we had been awarded a contract to produce a half million face shields, and we were able to begin immediately and go into production. Our collaboration with EDC allowed us to hire and employ over 80 New Yorkers, bringing them jobs, pay, and a great sense of purpose in our city's recovery. We set exceptionally stringent safety qualifications to ensure not only the safety of our team, but also the quality of our product. In a time where many citizens don't wanna set foot outside of their homes, over 80 qualified New Yorkers raised their hands to produce shields for their city. To date, We've supplied New York City with half a million face shields for distribution into the city's hospital system. And we're now proud to continue our efforts as EDC recently ordered an additional 1.1 million shields. And we're doing all of that out of a small 3,000 square foot event space behind me where we just lost power. As an early stage startup, we pride ourselves on moving at lightning speed. However, we have also been incredibly impressed with the speed, efficiency, and forethought by which EDC has operated in a time of crisis, which has allowed us and empowered us to do our part. Last but not least, over the course of this project, we've been moved by the immense gratitude our team members have expressed for the opportunity to support their city while also earning a paycheck for their families. And thanks to the mayor's office, city hall, and EDC, those paychecks will be spent right here in the city's local economy, 
creating a chain reaction of economic growth as we recover from the crisis. We thank you guys for the opportunity and for the chance to provide testimony. Thank you, Sam, even in the dark. Much appreciated <laughs> testimony. I got my fan on behind me too, so I feel when you pay. Thank you, Mr. Perovi. We will next hear from Will C. As a reminder to the public at this time, if your name has not been called and you wish to testify, please raise your hands using the Zoom raise hand function. We'll see, you may begin your testimony. Hi, I'm Starting Gene. time. Um, <clears throat> Will Kane, <clears throat> faculty member at CUNY, and I, I'm coming to you, I, I don't know if this is the appropriate uh, venue, but I have a concern about CUNY and I've tried to reach out to them and it's very difficult to get a hold of folks during this time and this, this is an economic development issue as far as I can tell. So. I'll be concise. Um, I was recently notified by the US government, National Institutes of Health, that I was to receive a $500,000 $500, um, grant. And the college at which I work has decided to decline that grant um, in an arbitrary fashion. So I've been trying to reach out to folks to explain um, the situation. The grant is to fund research about um, adolescent bullying and long-term mental health uh, impacts, also sexual health impacts and also would help to um, employ students and new staff at CUNY. So that's how I see the economic development connection. As you may know, CUNY is facing a $32 million uh, possible cut from the city. So $500,000 is, is nothing to sneeze at, right? Um, and I would like someone to possibly reach out to me so we can figure out a way to help this move forward. The feds have let me know they're gonna uh, let go of this grant in about a week if CUNY can't figure out what's going on on their side um, as you're, uh, expert witness testified earlier, there's, this is not a time to kind of um, thumb our nose at federal funds. Uh, everyone's hurting in the city right now. This is obviously an unprecedented economic crisis. So I'm not sure how else to kind of um, emphasize the urgency with this particular project, but I think if there's one hand, one bird in the hand, it's better than two in the bush. Um, so I'd love for someone to reach out to me to figure out a solution to be able to receive this $500,000 grant from the feds that's essentially being offered to us on a, pl on a platter. So thank you very much, have a nice day. So we'll, um, we'll definitely try to intercede for you with the chancellor, especially since he's um, taken over and going full steam now. Um, my legislative counsel, Alex Polinov, is gonna reach out to you and get your information and we will pass that on to uh, our new CUNY chancellor, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Um, seeing no additional hands raised for public testimony, this concludes the testimony of registered panelists. I'll now turn it back to Chair Vallone for closing remarks. Well, with that, thank you, everyone. Um, I know we are negotiating at this time every minute, so hearing the great work that EDC is doing, uh, fighting to get their budget restored, hearing the council members and all the individuals stories of the businesses that saved this city in the last three months from transitioning to the critical medical equipment that we needed um, from the staff who worked so hard to get this done, on behalf of myself and my family, even myself who was shrucking with the virus and was down for a couple of months. We were completely dependent on all of the companies that stepped up to really save the city. You were the unsung heroes. Uh, I'm glad today we got a chance to shine some of the light on you for that. So with that, we conclude today's uh, hearing and I thank you everyone for your hard work.